Welcome to our keynote presentation. Today we'll be talking to two, uh, I think it's fair to say, giants in the field of legal epidemiology, people who have spent uh, long and important careers investigating the health effects of laws and legal practices. Uh, our two guests um, are Jeff Swanson and Alex Wagonar. Um, Dr. Wagonar is Professor Emeritus at the University of Florida College of Medicine and a research professor uh, at the Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. Uh, he has uh, received a raft of awards uh, beginning in 1987 when he received the Exceptional Leadership Award from the American Public Health Association and most recently uh, when he received the 2016 Nan Tobler Award from the Society for Prevention Research in recognition of his work investigating and advancing the methods and outcomes of prevention research. <clears throat> Jeff Swanson, <clears throat> excuse me, is a professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Duke University School of Medicine and a faculty affiliate of the Wilson Center for Science uh, and Justice and the Center for Firearms Law at the Duke Law School. Like Alex, he has also been recognized frequently for his work. He received the 2020 Isaac Ray Award from the American Psychiatric Association and the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law for his outstanding contributions to the psychiatric aspects of jurisprudence. And he received the 2011 Carl Taub Award from the American Public Health Association for his work uh, in mental health services research. Uh, for me, um, both of these uh, gentlemen have been friends and mentors and role models in the work uh, that I've done on legal epidemiology. Uh, one of the uh, nice things about getting a large center grant like uh, Temple got for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Public Health Law Research Program was the opportunity to assemble an all-star cast of advisors. And along with um, Michelle Mello and Jennifer Wood, uh, Alex and Jeff were on the methods core of that research program and helped guide the development of uh, an, an approach to improving methods in the evaluation of law uh, and its health effects. And that seems like a good place to start this conversation. Gentlemen, we've generally argued that laws and legal practices can be studied like any other social phenomenon, but we often run into a certain amount of skepticism about that claim and about the validity of our methods. I wonder if you could talk to um, our audience a bit about why um, we can and should uh, trust uh, the approaches that that have been developed in our field to measuring the health effects of law and legal practices. Alex, why don't we start with you? Well, Scott, thanks a lot for inviting me to this conversation. You know, I've been privileged to work closely with great colleagues across a variety of disciplines, epidemiologists and economists, lawyers and engineers, psychologists and sociologists. And it's all been very rewarding and especially so working with you and Jeff. Well, on methods, I think maybe um, a major current problem in the field that we could discuss a little bit regarding methods is the simplistic dichotomization of study designs into RCTs, randomized controlled trials, versus, quote, mere observational studies. With the former leading to causal inference, RCTs, and the latter purportedly not valid for causal inference. This, I think, is a mistake. Mm -hmm. Randomization is a great design tool to improve causal inference and should be used whenever we can use it. But what's important to realize is there's many other great design elements to improve causal inference and the creative combination of many design elements 
can achieve stronger causal inference even than a study using random assignment. What kind of design elements are we talking about? You know, it's the, it's the things that we know. Using many repeated measures, perhaps hundreds or thousands of repeated measures in time series studies. It's taking into account the functional form of the effects of a particular law or policy. It's not just the pre-post difference that we're looking at. It's does the form of how the effect rolls out, does it grow or evolve over time, matching the theory that underlies the law or the intervention, or does it match the implementation, the rollout in the implementation of a new law or policy? And we can use comparison jurisdictions we can use comparison groups within those comparison jurisdictions. We can use comparison outcomes within the groups that are within the jurisdictions that are passing these laws. That is, we use multiple comparison groups that are relevant, plus we can hierarchically or nest those comparisons to make very strong research designs. And we have things like replications of a policy. People do it across units, across states, across provinces, across organizations, and they do it across time. So we have replications over time. And we can do dose response sort of studies with laws, looking at the intensity, if you will, or maybe implementation fidelity, and see how the effect of the law changes based on that intensity or that implementation fidelity. So, I mean, we have a lot more details on this. You can see our natural experiments chapter in our book on public health law research methods for more. But getting back to the core problem, you know, if we only value RCTs, randomized controlled trials, that directly shapes what we study. And it's often the smaller or less significant question because that's where the randomization design element can be used. So a sole focus on RCTs leads us to a focus on interventions that have maybe larger effect on an individual person, but it has that effect on a smaller number of individuals as opposed to our interest in our field, we're looking at laws that are affecting uh, many millions of people. And we're looking for effects across all those millions of people in the population. And the effect on any given single person in that population may be very small, but the aggregate effects on a whole society are very large. So the, this methodological kind of debate where some journals and you know say you cannot even use in any language to suggest a causal interpretation unless the study is based on an RCT. It kind of puts a lot of our stuff off the table. And it's not just us as a group of people because we're interested in this topic. It has an impact on science and it has an impact on society because it shapes what is looked at and what's studied and what's deemed effective and what perhaps is not deemed effective. So oh, randomization, randomization is a good tool. You know, we can use it, we can use it for, for important questions in our own field, like, like testing the, a particular causal link. We have a theory about how a law is working and there may be a sub piece of that, one mediator, one part of the causal link, you know, about, um, you know, testing out the nature of a particular behavioral incentive or a disincentive or something like that. And even if those test conditions then in that study are artificial, the results can help build the theory. They can lead us to innovate policy, try different things. So that randomization is still helpful, but it only works in those kinds of cases. But if we want to study, which is critically important, the population level effects of law in the real world, it requires more creativity and it requires us to, to build in, to create very strong research designs that use multiple elements that enhance causal inference. And that often is done typically without randomization and still creates very high plausible 
causal inference. Well, that, that's a strong, a strong case for, for not letting randomization be a shibboleth in the realm of, of public health law research. Jeff, does this resonate for you in your work? Yeah, thank you, Scott, first of all, for inviting me uh, to be a part of this conversation. It, I really appreciate it, and I so appreciate uh, your leadership in the field of public health law research over the years and the chance to collaborate with you. Uh, Alex, that was a marvelous answer. I'm not, you know, uh, and a great takedown of RCT fundamentalism, I think. Um, and I, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to, to add to what you said, uh, but, but let me just go back for a minute to where you started, uh, Scott, which is the skepticism uh, that, we, that we sometimes encounter and sort of the pushback and the critique. And um, I think it's, it's worth thinking about the reasons for that. Uh, and I think that there are uh, several, and, and they're not all misplaced, by the way. There are plenty of examples of bad research in public health law where the design and the method is just no match for the question that, that uh, the researchers are trying to answer. Um, but, but I also uh, think about the, the, the reasons for the skepticism, and I think they have to, some of them have to do with the nature of the phenomena that we're studying, the questions we're asking, and, and what is at stake for society and the answers that we give, and the, and the nature of the audiences for our research. So we, we're talking to academics across disciplines, we're talking to elected officials and advocates and other stakeholders who are invested in um, you know, one answer or another to a question. So you, you, you ask something like, does this particular state law uh, benefit the public's health? Or perhaps does it adversely affect uh, the public's health? What's the social cost and how do you uh, balance those? Um, the answer is going to be inherently complex because the health benefit you're measuring is almost certainly going to be multi-determined. It's is caused by many different things that, that uh, you know, interact with each other directly or indirectly. Um, and, uh, and, and many of those uh, factors that are important are uh, either unobservable or they're unavailable. You might be trying to detect what's a pretty weak effect in terms of a weak signal. Uh, you have this problem that um, the only uh, evidence that's going to be acceptable is something that comes out of a uh, you know, double-blind randomized clinical trial, and um, which, again, as you said, I, I completely agree, Alex. I mean, that often gives you a, an answer with great internal validity that may or may not generalize out to the real world to uh, populations where you have people with co-occurring uh, health conditions living in adverse social environments um, who may have different attitudes about, uh, you know, health behaviors and all kinds of, you know, countervailing uh, pressures and so on. When we're looking at the treatment, we're talking about people's exposure to a law. And that's something that's at the individual level, very difficult to randomize, to randomly assign someone to exposure or not exposure to a law. There are ways of doing that at the population level, you know, with these, as you say, repeated measures, uh, you know, difference and difference in different jurisdictions. Um, but it's, it's very hard to do that at the individual level. Um, we, we have tried. We had to get district court judges to agree to let us flip a coin to assign someone to mandatory versus voluntary mental health treatment coming out of the hospital. And I thought that was going to be a slam dunk. And what happened was the minute we got into the community with that protocol, um, that's where the trouble started because the, uh, the, the, the judges had, had assigned people to many different lengths of period of mandated treatment from two weeks all the way up to 12 months. And that turned out to matter. And so, you know, once, once people were out there exposed to the real conditions, we were kind of back where we started because the people who got six months or more of outpatient commitment actually had a great significant benefit. But our critics said we were just capitalizing on selection because the people who got renewed and got the long orders were the ones that were doing well. We actually, I think, showed the opposite was true, but that didn't really matter, which brings me to the Third, I think, uh, reason why we, uh, you know, have a struggle, and that is because the topics that we are studying are controversial. People are often encamped uh, against each other, you know, uh, on, on, uh, base, on the basis of ideological views about regulatory approaches to, to uh, health behaviors and treatment and so on. And so uh, they're, they're invested in trying to find something, some reason why, you know, you, what you're studying, you know, doesn't work. 
Um, and you know, we came back and, and, and evaluate a legislatively eva uh, mandated evaluation of New York's outpatient commitment law using a huge database matched uh, Medicaid records and all these other things. And we did repeated measures kinds of um, analyses. And, you know, the, the people that didn't like outpatient commitment still don't, you know, and, and they still think it's about coercion uh, rather than about access to treatment. So, you know, I agree entirely with uh, your, um, you know, description. Um, I just think that it is an ongoing struggle. And sometimes arguments about methods are really about other matters, uh, you know, in public health law. I could say more, but uh, let me just uh, stop there and take. Well, it does. It, it, thanks, Jeff. It does take me to um, a study that, that uh, some of my colleagues at the Center uh, for Public Health Law Research did a few years ago of 35 years of NIH grants, um, <coughs> which we tried to identify all the grants that actually studied the uh, implementation or impact um, or the creation of a, of a, of a legal intervention um, for health. And in that period, just the most recent period, which we looked at, which was 2010 to 2014, there were 218,000 NIH grants given out to extramural researchers. And we found 247 that had to do with law in any way. I you know that fit sort of the definition of public health law research. So, I mean, I think I don't think it takes much persuading for us to say that although we shouldn't have gotten all that money, um, that probably, um, you know, there were more important questions in public health law than 247 yeah. um, out of 200 and 20,000 grants. That's a pretty uh, small it's, percentage. It's a tiny percentage. And I do think they're the bias. That's where you actually see the RCT bias having a really power, powerful effect. And I think a lot of our um, audience today are people who would like to do quasi-experimental studies using analytic tools and design methods for improving causal inference, but um, are wondering about how they actually build a career doing that um, when you have such uh, an uphill battle with the largest health research funder there is. And I think part of our, our work is to be advocates for a change in that. Um, and part of that argument is really a methodological argument. But I wonder if you two have any other thoughts about sort of the strategy of um, getting the funding to do this research, which you are um, you know, so compellingly convincing on uh, in terms of their 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 validity. You know, I think the the right at the start, we just we have to be as as good as we can be in our research designs and in our methods. And um, it's not like we're doing second class research or or anything like that. It's, it's like we understand we need to understand research design better than the people that are just doing standard RCTs are really, you know, Fisher worked this all out. This has been pretty cut and dried for decades and decades and decades on how to do RCTs. And, and they're important and they're great and they're wonderful and there are many scientists doing them. And I don't want to be quoted out of context saying somehow I'm against them. No, it's all wonderful. But we have really important questions for society that we need to address. We need to do the best science that we can do to stand up to that. And part of that is, is having that confidence as scientists when we're writing these proposals. And part of it is being smarter than the rest of them. And so let's just get back to randomization for a minute. A lot of people think randomization is just some magic thing. And I guess in a way, it is a magic thing. It's great when it was first discovered. But the reason, let's, under, let's get back to the reason why randomization is so great. And the reason that randomization is wonderful is because we know with surety exactly how people were assigned to the treatment versus control conditions. We firmly have that knowledge without bias. If it's a properly implemented RCT, randomized control trial, right? But the, 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 the important thing is that we know what that assignment mechanism is. Well, randomization, if you just step back for a minute, 
is just one assignment mechanism. And there are others that we have in, in studying laws where sometimes we know with surety, with essentially no measurement error, um, we know what the assignment mechanism is. For example, a lot of interventions, a lot of laws that give some benefit or give some condition to people based on their income level, but it runs only to $10,000 and then it's cut off. So everybody under 10,000 gets it, everybody over 10,000 does not get it. It's not random assignment, but it's a fixed assignment mechanism. If we have something like that, we can directly do a regression discontinuity design study with very high causal inference, just you know, as good as a randomized trial because we know the assignment mechanism. So anyway, back to the larger question that you were raising, Scott, it's, um, it's a little bit as, you know, we have, to be, we have to be smarter and we have to have the ability to stand back and, and, uh, and argue back against these things when people are in their own smaller worlds thinking simplistically, RCTs are the only way to go and we're just not going to pay attention to anything else. Jeff, how do you help your, you know, your, your mentees and postdocs um, navigate this kind of problem? The question of how we try to change things from the top in terms of um, readjusting funding priorities so that, um, you know, the kinds of studies that we do uh, say that um, use quasi-experimental methods are, are valued. One thing that we have to do is, um, is get out of our own, you know, um, uh, small kind of balkanized world where we're just doing our own research and really engage in conversations with, um, you know, people who are connected to the, um, to the funding decisions and the funding announcements and who actually have a mandate, um, you know, say from, from Congress, NIMH, for example, has a, has a mandate, SAMHSA has a mandate to reduce suicide at the population level. You know, you look at um, um, maybe some other areas of medicine where research in cancer and heart disease, th th these kinds of things have, have impacted the actual metrics at the population level. So you see mortality rates going down over time. That's partly due to, uh, you know, better, uh, better treatments, but it also has to do with public health interventions to improve health behaviors. And meanwhile, you know, suicide has gone up in the last two decades, despite, uh, you know, the federal government pouring billions of dollars into neuroscience to try to, you know, figure out um, what are, what, what's happening in the brain when people engage in intentional self-injury. Well, you know, so we could stand back and say, you know, as, as epidemiologists, um, let's, let's uh, maybe put some of that focus, um, instead of trying to understand exactly what's going on in the brain, to just do what we could do to have not so many people dying, right? So let's like, because even if you came up with a magic molecule uh, today to um, cure mental illness, let's say, and that is a strong vector in suicide, if you can't distribute it to the population because, um, you know, they're addicted or they're in jail or they don't want the treatment or they're homeless. Um, and we have all of these problems out there with service delivery. Um, and, you know, um, and, and, and they have a firearm in their hand, which, you know, is a huge thing, uh, you know, means of suicide matters. And maybe we could do something to make sure that until the day comes when we don't have people inclined to harm themselves, that we, you know, have fewer of them that have this incredibly lethal killing technology in their hand at the time and don't get a chance to survive. So those are questions that the neuroscientists, uh, you know, they're frustrated, you know, that because they have, they have envy of other areas like, uh, you know, cancer uh, treatment and stuff. But we can point that out and we can actually do some studies that, that we can put in the hands of policymakers that demonstrate what we do. And, and so that we have this conversation between evidence-based um, laws and policies and practice-informed research. So we're actually listening to policymakers and we're asking the questions and addressing the questions that if we get the answers to them, they're actually going to matter rather than 
you know, asking a question that even if you get the answer, it's not going to move the needle on population health. So, you know, I think being out there as kind of a public intellectual and trying to talk to people about this and write essays and, and op-eds and things that you might not get rewarded for, you know, in, 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 in tenure promotion matters. And we can do that uh, more than we do. Well, I think that you, know, you guys both have exemplified the potential uh, in your careers for actually making a difference and for saving lives through through information about policy that policymakers then take up and apply. And that I think to me is the strongest, you know, the strongest thing that keeps me going. Um, the idea that, well, the NIH may diss us to some degree, uh, may not support us as much as we, we like, but, but we have a good reason to keep doing what we're doing. We have a good reason to keep going with that fight. Um, yeah. I noticed a couple of weeks ago in the Milbank Quarterly an interesting piece by Fred Zimmerman about epidemiology and about public health research, um, making the case that it needed to become more politicized, um, that it needed to become more engaged. Um, now, you know, the, the problem of, of spending too much on basic research and not enough on, on actual the social and behavioral science of how that research gets translated into action is being displayed for us right now with COVID. Um, sure. As far as we can tell, there was you know, uh, no NIH money <clears throat> spent on the behavioral science of getting people to accept vaccines. Um, lots of money went into the vaccine. Um, the, the institute that's responsible for education got no stimulus money, even though one of our biggest questions is, is it safe or not safe to have kids in school? Um, so you know, we're seeing this this, this neglect of vital issues that are actionable right now playing out. But one of the things that Zimmerman said was that, that I think also relates to methods and relates to causal inference indeed, um, is that, that public health spends too much time documenting what happens and not enough time trying to study why it happens and how it happens. Um, and in this sense, I think we, um, come to another thing that we've talked a lot about in our book and a lot in our work and a lot in our grant reviews when we used to be giving out money in the public health law research program. And that's the importance of theory uh, as uh, a, a powerful driver, guide, and element of um, the kind of quasi-experimental and observational research you're talking about. So maybe you could say a little bit about theory and how you how that helps you strengthen your work uh, and your impact. Alex, you want to start us off? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, you know, a lot of policy work is, is a lot of policy evaluations, a lot of the science around policy, a lot of them are, are really atheoretical. They're just directly assessing the policy's effects on an important outcome, you know, such as car crashes or firearm deaths or, or whatever the case might be. And those are useful and important in their own right in kind of understanding the epidemiology of a problem and the prevention of specific problems. But they alone are not sufficient, I think, to really move the field forward. And I think Scott's already intimated why, because understanding how and why a particular effect happens that is, understanding the underlying mechanisms of effect then lays the groundwork for applying that intervention, that law, that approach, or that mechanism to a host of new problems, not just the one outcome that's originally studied. So if we're going to understand mechanisms, right, it requires theory. And oftentimes our theories are implicit, but it's much better if they're made explicit. So, you know, in some of my own research, consider the research on laws that are targeted at controlling DWIs, driving while impaired by alcohol. I studied them a lot some years ago, using strong time series design to study each U.S. state that changed their laws on things like mandatory minimum fines, mandatory laws about mandatory minimum jail time, the legally allowable blood alcohol limit while you're driving, and laws on suspending the driver's licenses of offenders. Well, we step back a little bit. What came out of all of that? Well, mandatory fines had kind of a modest effect 
on the crash rates. Mandatory jail laws had very little consistent effects on the problem. But the laws on suspending the driver's license had consistent and sizable effects. Basically, the small license penalty applied more quickly and more broadly was more effective than the more severe penalties that are applied after some delay. Well, now let's back up to the theory. It's pretty obvious. So uh, just to use a, a crazy example, what happens when you get a puppy and you need to train them? The key is rewarding them, right? We reward them with a smile, attention, petting them, or even giving them a treat immediately when we see them doing a behavior we desire. You don't give them the reward. You don't give your puppy the reward a week later or even an hour later. This is well-established theory in operant conditioning, right? A reward or punishment shapes behavior to the degree that it is closely associated in time. It's connected in time to the behavior that you want to encourage or deter. Well, 46 different US states across three decades of time have run this natural experiment with administrative, that is quick, driver's license suspension. From the traffic safety studies, we know a less severe penalty administered immediately is more effective than a more severe penalty administered later. Well, then we could bring in further theory from social psychology and sociology about norms and modeling and communication networks, et cetera, to better understand how these laws accomplish their objectives. But finally now, we apply that theory, the broader lessons from a decade or two or three of research in traffic safety on drunk driving, we apply that to the opioid epidemic or any other problem that you're currently studying. So that's where the theory building is, is so important. That, that allows us to expand out and have a huge impact on society, even though we're studying just this arena that may be very important, car crashes, but it has implications for all these other problems as well. Well, you know, our, our colleague, Evan Anderson, uh and I were recently writing a, a little review of the COVID response and what the evidence was. And one of the interesting points he made, I thought was that um, that kind of basic research or that kind of research on the mechanisms of legal effect um, should be considered sort of our basic research and should get more attention and funding because when you have a new problem like COVID, uh, you can't do you know, three or four years of studies to figure out what will be the most effective response. You've got to design a response right away. And you've got, and the only thing you can base that on in terms of, of knowledge and evidence is analogous evidence or sort of basic evidence. So it's kind of like, why did we get a vaccine in a year? Um, because we had been spending lots and lots of money on basic research for the previous, you know, decade or more um, on RNA delivery systems and so on. So, you know, we, we often, we ha I think we have still neglected that kind of research, even though it's, it's quite, you know, it's not just some things like deterrence, as you talk about, you, your, your work in tax uh, has also been really useful. People know that if they have an alcohol tax, it reduces consumption by a sort of predictable amount. And guess what? That same sort of <laughs> predictable impact happens if you use a cigarette tax, or even if you, it turns, it's turning out if you use a sugar sweetened beverage tax. You know, so we don't always have to you know, wait for the evaluation retrospectively if we have this kind of foundational or fundamental research to help us uh, at the start. But Jeff, you know, I you you you're a real test case here because you're a, a, you know an incredible, an exquisitely well trained um, sociologist with a capacious uh, sociological imagination, working with a bunch of psychiatrists and yeah. you know, other people who perhaps have a quite different worldview. How have you been able to? you know, draw upon sociology and how has that, you know, helped you shape um, research in the area that you, areas that you work in? 
Well, you know, sometimes it's fun to be the only sociologist with, with a bunch of medical people because you could say something that would be perfectly obvious to every sociologist and they think that you're a genius. You made that up yourself. You know, social determinants of health and things like this. So, you know, I again, I, I appreciate your answer, um, Alex. I think it's, it's, it's um, you know, right, right on. I would think it's probably true that, you know, we, we are a bit um, impoverished in the, in the theory department. And there's a reason for that which is that we, we are, are deliberately um, in the business of being applied social scientists. I mean, if we had wanted to, if I had wanted to go and, um, you know, be an academic sociologist, the purpose of which is to develop, to develop theories, even if people don't care about them, um, then I would have had a different career. I made a deliberate choice to um, work in an interdisciplinary way in a medical school and psychiatry department where, um, you know, you're, you're incentivized, at least I, I am, in the kind of work I'm doing, to, to answer that question of what works, right? And so if you find something that works, um, then, you know, sometimes we're less interested in drilling down to the question of, of, of why and, uh, and these mechanisms, because we just want to go out and implement that. But ironically, once we get into the implementation, that's where I think sometimes our lack of theory uh, gets us in trouble because if we had a theory that actually shows how all of these things are connected to each other in some overarching way, it maybe that would have told us um, who's most likely to benefit from this intervention and who's maybe not likely to benefit from it and um, or or you know what uh, what needs to be in place in a in a community or a political environment or a workplace environment in order to have this intervention have any chance of getting traction um, so you know, and, and I think, but, but what's challenging again is if, if, you know, let's say you're, you're, you're in injury prevention and you're trying to develop, you know, evidence for ways to reduce violent behavior. So, well, what causes violent behavior? I mean, it kind of depends on uh, what level of resolution, you know, you're actually uh, looking at this from. So you might, you might be a neuroscientist and you say, well, gosh, this is about, uh, the dopamine system. Let's take a group of uh, homicide offenders and compare the cerebral spinal fluid of those who committed their crime impulsively and those who deliberated about it and thought about it and had some malice of forethought. And you find, guess what? There's a greater um, level of some, you know, uh, of a genetic mutation for an enzyme that's related to some dopamine uh, metabolite. Well, great, that might actually be interesting. And, and it may have implications for legal questions like culpability and things like that over time. But it doesn't, it, it's not going to make much sense to people who are looking at it from this different resolution of saying, violent behavior is a socially uh, produced and culturally conditioned behavior that, that, that has to do, it's a traumatic echo of, of people's uh, awful childhood that they're reprising in adulthood. And uh, we need to try to get upstream and have healthier communities with fewer kids exposed to trauma. So how do you connect these different levels of theory where you know, you're, you're talking about the neurobiological uh, you know, phenomena of hostility and aggression? Um, so it is, it is kind of, it's, it, it is challenging, but you know, I, I, I kind of think what we need, sometimes theory is too big a word for it. We might need, um, some really good causal frameworks where we can actually identify domains of variables and have sort of little mini theories about how things are connected and then use that. But I mean, we've certainly used theory in some of our research. Uh, you know, one little example, we studied this legal tool called a psychiatric advanced directive, which is premised on the idea that people can plan ahead for a period of time when they're going to lose capacity to make decisions and put in place, you know, their preferences, what are going to happen, and then compare that with a, with a, a proxy decision maker with healthcare power of attorney. Well, there's a, there's a theory, you know, from uh, cognitive psychology that, that called affective forecasting theory. And what it does is it, it tells you, and there are experiments with this, that um, people make all kinds of cognitive errors in trying to forecast what they would want in the future. Often what they think they would want isn't what they actually do want at the end of the day. And people who think it would be just terrible if something happened, when it does happen to them, we adjust to it uh, and we, we equilibrate. It's not as bad as we thought it was going to be. Or, you know, so people will say things like, I would never want to live on a ventilator. 
Well, that's baloney. A lot of people, you know, if the alternative is dying, live on a ventilator for a long periods of time and have a pretty good quality of life. Um, so, you know, we applied that, you know, in terms of developing our uh, intervention. And it's one reason why it's actually probably better to have a proxy decision maker that you really trust who knows you very well and can understand these future contingencies that you can't anticipate. Uh, you know, I mean, so, so there, are, there are ways in which you can apply what we know. Uh, but, but in general, we're rewarded for getting out there and implementing something on a short timeline. And I think we have to kind of fight back a, a, about that. I have tried to, um, to do that, um, you know, uh, but I, you know, I still, I still, I still struggle with it, you know, I, and, and uh, uh, well, you, you, you know, but I'm glad I had the career I've had rather than, you know, try, I was, one, I was criticized in an early job interview because I didn't understand, I couldn't read German. And so I had never been able to read Max Weber in the original German. And so I probably misunderstood it, but that does, turns out not to matter to me now. <laughs> das ist ein Problem. Okay. Das ist ein Gros but, uh, but anyway, I'll give you that. But because you've raised so many other important points, and, and one thing that always strums my heartstrings yeah. is the is the arg is, is is what you talk about. Well, I think of it as transdisciplinarity, the true yeah. melding, as sure. you've done in your work, of of different theoretical and and methodological traditions. Because you know we we all of us in any standpoint have a bias. Any method is biased, any theory is incomplete, and it's, the, it's through the combination that you start to put together a, a mosaic um, that, 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 that captures more of the phenomenon that you're interested in. Um, the, the question of, of, of methods and the question of theory, though, I think also gets to... Um, or takes us further into the territory that both of you have talked about, which I think is the, the, the role of the public intellectual or the researcher as someone who is trying to, to get people to see the broader picture. And yeah. in this respect, I, I think in America today, um, you know, in, 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 a, in a public health realm where the idea of social determinants of health and, and the impact of social structure on the level of distribution of health uh, the the way that that social exposures and 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 social position wear people um, out sooner or later um, over the life course all these things are very well established in our field we understand them um, but even among I mean, let alone the public even among our colleagues you know it can often be difficult to get get people to move away from the dopamine. You know, you sort of feel like sort of step away from the bench, sir. You know, look out the window, please, and see, right. you know, how the, the, the biomedical phenomenon you are investigating is actually situated within this broader social perspective. So I at least have come to feel that um, <clears throat> it is, it, it must become, you know, a, a, a standard part of everything I do to contextualize, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, you, you're, you're a big fan of causal models, I know, Jeff, and, and, and have, have written some good things in our great chapter in our book, uh, Methods book about causal modeling, but to get people to step back and say, whatever I am studying, and even though I'm quite interested in the, um, the particular, uh, you know, say, deterrent effect of a penalty, I am looking at that in terms of in the context of a society in which five dollars ain't the same right. for every person, um, right. you know, that that might be exposed to that fine, um, and that for some people five dollars could actually be a, a, a pretty unhealthy uh, and powerful uh, uh, factor in you know whether they pay their rent uh, next next week or whether they can feed their kids. Uh, so I you know I talk a lot about um, equity. Um, and and point a lot to 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 the effects of social and you know especially wealth and income inequality. Um, I know that you've been um, recently writing a bit about um, racial inequity um, and and the effects of the potentially differential uh, benefits and costs of law uh, right. uh, being spread by race. Maybe you could. I wonder if you guys could say a little bit about how you think about our role in raising questions of disparities and equities and how that fits into the research you choose to do um, and the way you choose to do it. 
Who do you want to go first? Jeff, why don't you go ahead? Because I know you have this, this sure. piece you've just. <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah, I've written previously about um, this issue of racial inequities uh, in the application of mental health law in particular. Uh, and, um, and so recently I've been trying to sort of translate some of that um, thinking and perspective to the problem of um, you know, firearm restrictions. We have to kind of separate out the, um, the consideration of, of differences and disparities and discrimination from the uh, immediate context where people make decisions that are discriminatory and, and the upstream if, uh, institutionalized ways in which these disparities are baked into our system way up. So you could have a decision maker, you know, who like deciding whether somebody should be on outpatient commitment or not, who could be completely colorblind. And you're still going to end up with what, you know, in, in New York, uh, the New York lawyers for the public interest accused this whole policy of being racist because black people were seven times more likely to get on mandated outpatient commitment than white people were. But, but, if you, but if you then go upstream and you say, well, let's look at uh, who's actually diagnosed with serious mental illnesses and substance abuse disorders. Let's look at who's in the public behavioral health system for reasons of, of financing. Let's look at who gets involuntarily committed to the hospital. Let's look at who gets incarcerated because that's another way people qualify for this. And our analysis sort of, we took that apart. We just deconstructed it and we looked at racial disparities using different denominators, right? The denominator of the whole population down to the denominator of people who are actually sort of eligible in the public system for this intervention. The, the disparity goes way down once you get to this very highly sorted population. Then the question you also have to ask is, when you when you using the IOM framework, you don't have just a difference, but you have a disparity because your difference is in need or however you define it, is the intervention that is, that is being um, delivered disproportionately to say young black men, is that beneficial or is it harmful, right? So like in, 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 to go to the firearms law example, in California, for example, and many other states, if you are involved with the juvenile justice system, you are prohibited from purchasing or possessing a firearm until you're 30 years old. You have to have a, this period through your whole adult, you know, first decade of your adult life, crime-free, and then you can, even though your juvenile record might have been expunged. Well, from a public health point of view, we might think that makes sense because this is a high-risk population. We're going to save people's lives. But maybe if you are looking at it from the perspective of a person who says, well, you're taking my gun away and I need that to be protected, or uh, looking at it from the justice reform perspective that says, well, we want to make sure people aren't um, you know, incarcerated, uh, then you think, well, maybe, maybe we need to look at it from a different point of view. And, and, then, and then you look at some of these gun laws, for example, the North Carolina pistol permit law, which was passed in 1919, and it gives sheriffs this discretionary criterion to deny a pistol permit to anyone who lacks good moral character. And if you look at what was being written when that law was passed in the height of the Jim Crow era, it looks pretty transparently like, like it was a way to give sheriffs the, uh, the, the uh, discretion to deny a, a pistol permit to black people who lacked good moral character. But now do we flash forward and say, well, this is fruit of the poison tree, so let's not have a pistol permit law at all because it originates in this. But many of our institutions today, just about all of them, have this origin story in a, in a period where white supremacy uh, was, uh, you know, was really uh, underlying everything. So I think what we need to do is, among other things, bring this question of racial equity, racial justice, and uh, front and center, and make it a, a really important outcome to study in just about every intervention we study, particularly those that have to do with institutions in the criminal justice system, law enforcement, policing, uh, and so on. Well, Alex, you know, you, I've had the privilege at my center of working with you and, and Kelly Comro and, and your team at Emory on some studies that were aimed at taking your traditional quasi-experimental approach um, to uh, the question of whether income support programs of various kinds um, have positive health effects. So basically asking the, to me, the basic question of if you have a lot of income inequality, does giving the poorer people more money 
um, reduce some of the negative health effects of that. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, that work as an example of how our public health law research can go right to the, the heart of social determinants uh, and inequities. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Scott. Um, I think uh, I'll get to the specifics of the research in a minute, but you know, this whole area of social determinants of health is so critically important. And it's not only for these fundamental so social justice reasons, with, which Jeff also alluded to, but it's because they affect the whole panoply of health and social problems, right? If we just stop and think about it, the potential here of uh, this, even if we have a specific law or policy and it improves the social determinants of health by some small fraction, say it's 1%. If we multiply that 1% benefit now, not just across the entire population, like we usually are when we're looking at population health, but now multiply it also across the whole long list of health and social problems that are made worse by these inequalities and the poor social conditions and environments in which people live. And fully understanding how best to use law to address these inequalities, of course, we got a long way to go. And we quickly get into these complex systems of reciprocal and reinforcing disadvantage. But you know, we're, we are where we are and we need to work towards, we just need to move forward and work towards improvements. And so uh, I'm part of this great team at Emory University that uh, uh, Scott has been involved with as well, led by Professor Comrell, looking at the effects on child health of family economic security and, and specifically how they're affected by laws, state level laws on minimum wage and earned income tax credits, because this is what feeds more money to the people that are in the lower rungs economically. And we found significant effects on birth outcomes and infant health, but there's a lot more research needed and there's a lot of stuff waiting to be done. I mean, this is really an area right for a lot more attention uh, by our field and on the role of various mechanisms in addressing this. So just as one example out of that research, just a small example, we found that the size of the tax credits are monotonically related to the magnitude of the beneficial effect on infant health. In other words, the larger the tax credit, the larger the reduction in low birth weight births, for example. It's logical. But there also appears to be an effect of the initial implementation of a new law on providing for a tax credit that is separate from the size of the credit. So this suggests that there might be some social influence processes associated with the initiation of the credit that operates independent of the amount of the credit. And this has implications for theory as well as future policy developments. So the, the, the economists, uh, just to oversimplify, you know, a dollar is a dollar. So they're going to quantify everything in a dollar. And, and you look at the effects of giving a dollar or you know, giving X number of dollars and they look at it that way. But, but this opens up, well, a dollar, as Scott said, a dollar to a, a poorer person is not the same as a dollar to a richer person. But the first dollar that's associated with some new program that, that facilitates getting into the workforce and and changes the dynamic in a family and relationships between partners and spouses, who knows what, but it just opens up. There's a whole lot of other social processes that are being influenced by this law, as well as the dollars that go into people's pockets that are also really important. But um, we also find the last point uh, is that African-Americans experience the larger absolute benefits, the beneficial health effects of the tax credits, they experience larger benefits, but they experience the same relative health effects of whites. So thus, you know, you just think of it, the, the differential effects are due to the existing disparities. Black families are at higher baseline levels of risk. 
but they, you know, the studies that we've done to date, they're just scratching the surface of all this needed research and policy innovation and advancement of theory to address just this realm of the social determinants of health around family economic security. Well, thanks. We're coming to the end of our discussion, but I want to give you both a chance to say any final words about where you think our, our kind of work um, is going or where you'd like it to go or, or um, anything else that you think would be interesting to people who are considering uh, a career doing the kind of work that you both have done so uh, well and impactfully over the last uh, well, not, not, I don't want to say how long, but in the past you have done and continue to do this important work. Any final words to um, future legal epidemiologists? Well, Scott, I was just thinking of the, sort of the two, two bookends in my career in terms of, uh, you know, what you could probably call public health law research all along. Um, and, and, and just, I'm struck by the the difference between where I started and where I am now, and this may have some, some, some implications for where we go forward. But you know, um, I, I'm remembering when I when I first started out, my first project was this uh, project to uh, to estimate the need for mental health services in all of these priority populations in a large uh, southern state, and we applied this very complicated statistical uh, uh, model called horizontal synthetic estimation. We went and presented the results to the um, mental health authority leadership team. They were very impressed with it, but they uh, pushed back because the, the deputy commissioner said the number of people you're estimating who need uh, mental health services in the highest priority is too high, too many people. And I said, well, uh, what number did you have in mind? And she said, well, we were looking for a number that would pretty much match the capacity of our state mental hospital system. Now, that makes sense now when I look back on it because they had no interest in us identifying all this need that they had no capacity to fulfill. So they wanted us to fuss with our criteria so that we could actually give them a more acceptable answer. And I thought at the time that all you would do have to do as a researcher, you're sitting up on this hill and you come up with this wonderful study and you put, push the boulder down the hill and it rolls down and by sheer force of gravity, it's gonna affect policy and that's gonna affect people and it's gonna improve the world. And I, what I realize now is that we're at the bottom of the hill sometimes pushing the boulder up and we have all of these pressures on us, but we just need to keep doing that. And you know, now I'm, I, I'm just looking back the last few years, I've had the privilege of being of seeing my research, uh, you know, used to, you know, to, to enact a new and I think very promising intervention in the area of gun violence prevention, the extreme risk protection order. When I started and we studied two states and we produced this finding that for every 10 to 20 of these legal actions of a risk-based fire removal, one life is saved through averted suicide, and it was presented in an easy kind of number needed to treat way. We put it in the hands of policymakers coast to coast. I got out there and I participated in dozens of forums all around the country with law enforcement people, with state legislators, with, you know, uh, academics and family members and, and advocacy groups. And we went from having two states that had a law like that to now 20 states and, and, and 19 in the District of Columbia. Now we have a big implementation problem. But that was a direct result of, of learning kind of how to do this and how to talk about it in, in, a, in, a, in a way that, you know, is very gratifying. So, I, you know, I think, I think we need to be inspired by the stories of success. I'd like to go back to our critical opportunities paper published in Millbank and they'll look at those five areas and see eight years later what's actually happened, you know, in, in those. And I think we would, we would, we would uh, there's going to be a mixed bag. There are many, many more people, talented young scholars who are going into public health law research, legal epidemiology. I think that's going to translate into a, a, a bigger benefit for the field. Um, you know, so we keep on keeping on. We have to be in this for the long range. Alex? Well, I think uh, uh, one important point that uh, after doing this for whatever four decades that I think turns out to be really important in terms of 
have, having one's work have a real, uh, an impact on society, an impact on science. And that is strategically choose what to study and when to study it. I, I think that's really important. You know, think of the big picture, right? We need to think of the, the big picture about society and where we're at and think about how we know diffusion happens. And when a new innovative law is being tried in a, in a couple of places, a couple of cities, a couple of states or whatever, if you think that it's based on strong theory, it's a pressing prob social problem and it may work, even though the sample is small, it might be a little harder to study, it might be a little bit harder to get published, but the time is right, right? I mean, that's an opportunity. And, and study that, that example, because those early studies that show, oh, the state that tried this, and it was shown to be significantly effective on an important health or social problem, that feeds into the diffusion to the other states. And then after 20, 30 years, the whole country or multiple countries in the world have a particular law or policy in place that started somewhere. And that early research was central in nurturing it along from the first couple places that tried it and gave it a base to say, this is effective. And, you know, this looks like it's significantly effective. And that's how to have a career, I think, that when you when you look back over decades, uh, the large impacts were that's how they started. Well, um, those were inspiring words, and I think I want to add just a few few glosses on them. Um, you know, I'd like to be in a world, and I think we should be fighting for a world in which those people who fund and support research are investing in uh, helping us identify those important questions as quickly as possible. Um, when legal innovations roll out in life to evaluate them as quickly as possible, to learn what we can about their implementation, um, to treat that as an urgent problem, um, to make sure that the treatments we are launching upon millions of people for who knows how long um, are effective and don't have negative side effects. You, in, in your work and in, as you've discussed in this, in this hour, um, have shown that we can actually do rigorous research to discover um, what these laws are doing. We can be confident in the results that we get about the effects they're causing. Um, we have, um, I think, made clear in this, in, this, in this conversation as we have in our work that the full range of social psychological, sociological, economic, epidemiologic theory can be drawn upon to help explain and study and predict um, legal related phenomena. Uh, and that, that we're, you know, far from starting from scratch in this field, we are actually standing on, you know, shoulders of German speaking giants like Max <laughs> Weber and, um, you know, all the, 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 the subsequent researchers um, in social and behavioral health down to today. We know that right now, too little attention and too little investment is given to our kind of work. We know that some of that comes from methodological parochialism, and a bias, some of it is, is tradition, some of it's politics. Um, and yet we can't imagine, I think I can say, a, a more important way to spend one's career than doing this work. And I think that's what I wanna point out uh, or highlight to our audience as we finish. Um, you are looking at doing public health law research or legal epidemiology, and hopefully you are now convinced that it's worth doing um, and that it can be done. Um, but you're perhaps a little daunted by the challenge of finding a way to do it as a career. I think the, um, the remedy for that or the, the treatment for that um, sense of challenge is what you see in Alex and Jeff, the passion to answer important questions that are going to matter to the health and well-being of millions and millions of people. Um, and if you can keep that passion, um, you will have the greatest, um, <laughs> the greatest chance of convincing the doubters that they should um, give you their data, give you their money, um, give you their attention, 
um, and, and follow your um, advice um, because um, that's the bottom line. Um, societies as big and complex as ours facing the kinds of problems we have just can't afford to mess up um, in dealing with those questions. We've seen that with COVID. We've seen a year in which, which existing knowledge about disease control and about health communication and about leadership and about vaccine distribution and so on just hasn't been applied. Um, and the results are dire. Um, and this is just one of our problems. As we move forward into climate change, we talk about the opioid epidemic, as we talk about gun violence, um, as we talk about the, the, the ongoing effects of continuing racism. All these are problems we just don't have the luxury to screw up on. Um, and that means that although research doesn't determine political solutions um, and doesn't always even drive political solutions, it's still the best resource for intelligent political solutions uh, and still a, a resource for changing social attitudes and helping people see why solidarity and mutual concern and <laughs> mere rationality um, are actually path, the pathway towards a good and, and successful social life. So we will keep doing this, um, gentlemen, I know, and we hope that um, all of you watching will um, uh, continue to, on the path you're on to, to add to this important body of work. So I want to thank you all for attending this um, keynote presentation. I want to thank you all for um, watching other other presentations in this series and in the, the, growing, um, the growing library of important uh, resources on legal epidemiology and public health law research.